told you about the legislative process, which is important to Michigan for a number of other reasons, and one is the example that I gave about the JCOs process for building facilities like this that are all about the future. Somebody was saying the other day, well, you know, what do you want to build that building for? I said, well, it's, it's about, the, he said, I'll never use it. <laughs> I said, well, I guess it's not about us, it's about the future, and we're grateful for it. And that person I'd like to salute for his help in all of this, State Representative Rick Olson. <laughs> and while Rick is making his way up here, it could not have been done without Senator Richardville, the Senate Majority Leader, who led the JCOs process for us. And um, there were others, too. And Dale Zorn, of course, who you're going to hear from a little bit later today. Rick Olson. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, and a good morning it is. You know, I was just tempted to uh, break out in song from the Oklahoma, uh, the musical, and oh, what a beautiful morning, but I don't think I could compete with the previous singer, so I'll, I'll dispense with that. So uh, we're really lucky today to have the opportunity to have Governor Snyder with us today. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with him on a, uh, and his staff on a couple of different work groups, and I've really appreciated his data-driven, analytical, objective approach to issues. I'd like to talk to, uh, to you a little bit about a couple of the issues that I've, I've had a chance to work on and what the status of them is, because both of them are very, very important to Monroe County. The first one really stemmed from the campaign a couple years ago when I became aware that the roads here in Monroe County were not the best. Uh, so I asked to get on the Transportation Committee and ultimately served on a work group uh, for transportation funding. And uh, so I want to review a little bit of the findings that we, not only that our work group came up with, but a, a number of other studies recently in the last year and a half. Um, our study initially said that we needed $1.4 billion more to adequately fund our roads and bridges to, just to maintain the pavements. And uh, that number was picked up by Governor Snyder in his October um, special message on infrastructure. And uh, ultimately in January, then a series of 17 bills were introduced in the House of Representatives and companion bills, 13 of them in the Senate. And uh, we've done some work on them, but they haven't progressed as quickly as we would like. But uh, when we didn't get the job done last year, I thought we had better run that model again uh, that we used to fig figure out how much money we needed. And because of the year delay, uh, the number went up from 1.4 billion to over 1.5 billion more per year. And the year delay cost you as taxpayers $1.8 billion more over the next 12 years. So we got a problem. Um, w there are other studies that, have, that have, we've done. Uh, one of them, one of the legislators said we should really do this maybe 2 million more than 4 million, 400 million more than 600 million more. So we ran the model again. And what that showed is if we did it step by step by step, we're not gonna get where we wanna go. We are not going to have our roads and bridges at the state that we need them. Uh, so incrementalism doesn't, doesn't work. Um, the um, Michigan Chamber Foundation and the Anderson Economic Group just last week we also released a study indicating that if we invest the amount of money that we're talking about, that we would in increase uh, the jobs in this state of about 11,000 jobs. So bottom line, we've got a lot of work to do and we're hoping that we can make progress when we get back in lame duck. Uh, we had hoped to get things done earlier, but that's, we've got one session day in July, one session day in August, two and a half weeks in September, and then lame duck. So lame duck is the opportunity to do that. But I'm absolutely convinced that it's just like changing your oil in your car. It's, you, it's either pay me now or pay me later. And that's because we've really got to do that preventive maintenance, otherwise it'll cost us a lot more. So stay tuned on that issue. Um, I, the governor may say something about transportation funding. I, he probably say something about a bridge. Um, but there's also other infrastructure uh, investments that we really need to be looking at to take advantage of the geographical location we have. Uh, we are really on the trade route from Halifax, Nova Scotia, all the way through Mexico. 
and you, we'll be talking not only about the bridge, but you'll hear in the future much discussion about a new train tunnel from uh, Windsor to Detroit. You'll hear about a freight hub in Detroit. These are all very, very important initiatives that will be very, very important for job creation in Michigan. So stay tuned on all that whole infrastructure message. The other uh, big topic that we've been working on is the problem we've got with the Michigan Public School Employees Retirement System. The last uh, comprehensive annual financial report that we have seen on that showed that we've got an unfunded liability there of $45 billion. And we've been told that the new CAFR that's going to come out very shortly will show that that has risen to over $50 billion. Um, the, so the, the retirement and the health care benefits for retired school employees is in danger unless we do something. Uh, so we've worked for months on that, and we've come out with a proposal. Uh, the Senate passed a version. The House has passed a version. Uh, when we got uh, out of session two weeks ago, we were, able, were not able to reach agreement. Um, we'll be working behind the scenes between now and, and July 18th, and hopefully we will have something done on that. But it's really imperative that we do something on that to make sure that we, those benefits that we've promised our school employees will be able to be paid. So, um, so those are the two things that uh, I've had a chance to work closely with the governor. Uh, you be, feel free to ask him questions on many, many things. But like I said, it's really been a pleasure to work for someone who really comes at things objectively and doesn't look at things based on politics. It's been one of the disappointments uh, that I've had uh, in Lansing is that too many things are looked at in a political, ver political way. And uh, I've been told there's uh, an election this year. So uh, I, I'm sure by the time October comes around, um, you'll all be very, very tired of hearing about politics. So with that, um, okay. I'm not sure who I need to hand it back to. Oh, there we go. Dr. Nixon, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, State Representative Rick Olson. <laughs> Rick's predecessor, of course, Kathy Anger, had a lot to do with the, le the legislative process we talked about, too, and we want to sincerely thank her for that. And one, she was one of those in the original meetings when the faculty was designing the curriculum for that new career tech center. The other one was Senator Richardville. Couldn't be with us today because he's flown out to California. However, we have someone to introduce that is representing him as a member of his staff. And when I was talking about our faculty and students a little bit earlier, he's also one of our graduates, Jake McLaughlin, representing Senator Richardville. I'll just take a few seconds of your time. I'm Jacob on behalf of Senator Richerville. He couldn't be here today. He's out visiting his daughter in California and grandson. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to uh, the Meyer Theater, and we'd like to welcome Governor Rick Snyder to Monroe. We hope you enjoy this informative town hall meeting. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jake. Now, if you would please stand, remove your hats. We would like to reintroduce Molly for the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's regular the bombs bursting in That our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave? Thank you.
please remain standing. Rory Welling is going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, uh, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice of all. Wow. Uh, Senator Richardville told me never to follow kids or uh, cute puppies, but... Well, folks, thank you so much for coming out. My name is John Manor. I'm the Legislative Policy Director for Representative Dale Zorn, and I'm also a lifelong resident of Monroe County and a former student here at Monroe County Community College. I wanted to let you folks know that uh, we are going to be making a very valiant effort to ask uh, the governor all the questions that you guys have on your list. We have lots of duplicates, but I want to assure you that we will be getting to try We'll actually be trying to get to each one of the individual issues um, Also, the governor's office wanted me to make you aware that on Friday uh, the 29th That the governor's mobile constituent service office will be at Agua Dolce coffee and tea at 1519 North Telegraph uh, It's in the Big Lots Plaza behind McDonald's there on Telegraph Road They'll be there from 4.30 to 6.30, and uh, representatives from the governor's office will be there to answer uh, any questions that you guys may have. Um, as you can see, this is just a small stack of questions that we have, and I believe Dr. Nixon has a similar stack. What I'm going to ask is that if you have questions, to raise your card up, and I will come and pick those up. And uh, when the governor's uh, Q&A session starts, we'll be uh, getting to those. So thank you so much for your patience. Also, I wanted to let you know, any questions that we don't get to, we will be responding to either via email or a letter. So I want you to be assured that your questions will get answered. So thank you so much for coming out. And I believe Dr. Nixon is up. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Dale Zorn, state representative of the 56th district here in Monroe County. A year and a half ago, after a decade of economic crisis, after a loss of one million jobs, state lawmakers set out to rewrite the business model that not only would attract business to Michigan, but retain those that are currently here. Last year, we made hard choices to eliminate wasteful spending, making government more efficient and accountable. Since then, Michigan has become known as the comeback state, where unemployment is at a four-year low because new businesses are starting and existing businesses are confident to remain in Michigan. The steady decline of our population has ceased. Our children that have left the state are returning where dreams once again can be found, here at home in Michigan. It is a pleasure to have Governor Rick Snyder with us today in our home of Monroe County, especially here at one of our county gems, the Monroe County Community College, where they too are exper experiencing growth in building a new career technology center. I wish to thank the college and Dr. Nixon for their kindness in, ho in hosting this town hall meeting. Governor Snyder has been a relentless positive leader of our state, and he has brought a vision of reform unlike others, positive reform that has begun the reinvention of Michigan. During his inauguration, he said, we can only achieve extraordinary things if we aspire beyond traditional thinking. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the governor of this great state of Michigan, Governor Rick Snyder. Thanks, that was great. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Well, thank you for that wonderful welcome. 
And I want to compliment you. You have good taste. You've picked an excellent state representative. Let's give a round of applause for Dale. And I also want to recognize he has another colleague from the legislature here who's done a great do job, and that's Representative Rick Olson. And I'm excited to be here at the community college, and I want to thank Dr. Nixon for hosting us today. I'm a huge fan of community colleges. I actually be began my college career at Kellogg Community College um, back when I was a junior in high school, and it made a difference in my life. So I have a real appreciation for the role that community colleges can play. And you've got a great one here, doing some wonderful things. The, the Career Technology Center in particular is really exciting to me. Because I don't know if you've heard me speak, but quite often when I was even campaigning, I would go across the state talking about the need for more skilled tradespeople in our state. And the illustration of a position that I talked about all across Michigan, every corner of Michigan, was the need for more welders that we had enough demand that if you're a welder in the state, you could get a job in about 20 minutes in any corner. And I challenge people in the UP on this, and Detroit on this, and St. Joseph on this. And you've got one of the best welding programs, among many other things, at the Career Technology Center. So you should be proud of that. Now the real question is, how do we market it better? How do we get more people involved and grow programs like that to create jobs? But I'm here today to do a town hall for a couple reasons. Um, I like to do events like this because it does a couple things. One, it gives me a chance to communicate with you about what's been going on in Lansing and kind of the vision and focus, some of the accomplishments we've had happen, some of the challenges and the next things we're up to do. But it also gives me a chance to hear your questions, which is really important. Um, because that gets to one of the first things I want to mention to you is, what's the role of government? Dale was talking about the challenges we had a couple years ago and it was true, Michigan was broken. And our government was broken in the state, in my view. And we've made a lot of progress over the last couple of years, but we shouldn't be satisfied with where we're at. We're only beginning. But part of the reinvention of Michigan, because again, fixing Michigan is not good enough, but the reinvention of Michigan came back to a question of really defining who we are and why we're here and what we're trying to do. And one of those things is, what is the role of government? Because I believe that that's, that's gotten lost somewhere. Not just in Michigan, but across our country too often. Because if you think about it, think about what it, what's government supposed to do? Because when I became governor, after I got sworn in, it really got highlighted to me. Because I'd walk in a meeting, and people were usually pretty nice to the governor when you walk in a meeting. They say hi pretty friendly. At least they did until January and February of last year when I came out with the budget and stuff and tax reform. But they were friendly, but the first words out of their mouth would be, we need money or we want money. And the role of government isn't to be an ATM machine and just give out money. The role of government is to serve you. And that's something I've tried to bring to the table and really create a culture to say the role of government is we're a customer service business. And our customers are the citizens of our state and the organizations in our state. And our goal is to give you great customer service to show that you're getting a real return for what you invest. When we ask for those hardworking tax dollars, we need to show you measurable, transparent, tangible returns for those dollars. In the biggest picture, I know you don't feel this way quite often when you get that tax bill. In the big picture though, in many respects, we're just another shopping choice for you. That you need to decide how much government you wanna buy. And that we deliver critical things that other people don't sell, public safety, education are great illustrations. But when you buy those things, I want it so you feel like you've made a smart purchase. And that was a worthwhile purchase. Isn't that the way we should operate? Now, the other part that goes with that is job creation. Because the reinvention of Michigan was about more and better jobs and a future for our kids. Now, on the job creation front, the role of government isn't to create jobs. I mean, think about that. Would you want all 10 million of us working for the state of Michigan? That would be a really scary thing. Our role is to enable job creation to happen. 
to create the best environment for economic freedom, for people to build businesses, entrepreneurs to come along, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large businesses to flourish and to create jobs. And so that's what we've worked hard on, is making the best environment possible for job creation. And we've made a lot of progress. We had the worst unemployment rate in the nation. In August of 2009, we were at 14.2%. We're at 8.5% today. The national average is 8.3%. But I can tell you, 8.5% is still too high. We're the comeback state, but we got a lot of more work to do. So I don't want you to be satisfied. I don't want you to be content. Let's just keep going. We are on that right path. It's exciting. And as part of that, I'm going to pick one special item that I think is really cool, that's a great opportunity for us, that deals with jobs and kids. Is one thing I announced just a week ago or so was about building a new bridge, the new international trade crossing. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Because one of the challenges we've had is this is a situation where there's a party out there with the Ambassador Bridge that spent millions of dollars on misleading ads. So there's a lot of bad information out there. Because people wonder, why are we doing this bridge? And I wanted to clarify a couple things. Because this bridge is a great opportunity. It's about job creation. It's about long-term jobs, most importantly, international trade. If you draw a circle from Montreal to Chicago, it's a third of the North American economy. We're in the middle of that. And to make more trade happen with our biggest, best trading partner, Canada, we need another crossing. And then short-term jobs, it'll generate about 10,000 jobs on the Michigan side. Why it's being built. And the best part of all, it's not gonna take a dollar of taxpayer money from Michigan taxpayers. Because we have a great partner in Canada that's advancing the funds to pay for the Michigan part of the project. And those dollars will be repaid from tolls. No obligation to Michigan. It's absolutely clear. So what a great opportunity. And then we went to the federal government, the US government, and said, can we use those dollars for federal road matching projects, that Canadian investment in Michigan? And they said, yes. So we can use those dollars to do road projects in every corner of Michigan, including Monroe County. That's a really good deal. And thank you. But I actually have a special guest here. I want to welcome up on stage because in many cases you wonder, you're always hearing it from the Michigan side. And I'm proud to say we've got an awesome partner in Canada. They've been wonderful. And we have the Council General from Detroit with us today, Roy Norton. And I thought it'd be great to have Roy come up and just share for a couple minutes the Canadian perspective on why this crossing is so important and why they're so committed to be a great partner with Michigan. So let's welcome Roy Norton. Thank you, Governor Snyder and uh, Representative Olson, Representative Zorn. This is my second visit to Pure Monroe, as I understand this community is called. Um, it's. It's, um, it's my third visit to Monroe, uh, but I, was, I spoke in this hall about a year ago and met with President Nixon then, and at that time, the uh, Michigan-Canada trade relationship was about $63 billion, and it's now grown to $70 billion. Um, it's the most important trade relationship that Canada has, and it's the most important relationship that Michigan has. And so when you speak of partnership, I think uh, the numbers substantiate the importance of the partnership. I saw a sign outside um, that said, forget the bridge, we want health care. Canada's not proposing to pay for your health care. Um, but, but Canada is proposing to pay for our bridge. And Prime Minister Harper, when he was here and met with the governor in Windsor and in Detroit uh, on uh, Friday a week ago, uh, signed an agreement that our Prime Minister called the most important infrastructure project in North America. He said it's an investment that Canada's prepared to make in the manufacturing future of this region. He said it was the most important project that will be completed while he's prime minister. 
and he leads a conservative majority government and he's not going anywhere soon. So he's clearly anticipating that this will be the signature uh, infrastructure achievement of his prime ministership. I sat um, across from this gentleman um, uh, through several negotiations toward that agreement. Uh, and I can tell you that in addition to being a courageous leader uh, and a visionary leader and clearly an incorruptible leader, uh, he's also a formidable negotiator. Uh, this is an agreement that uh, most people, I think, would be happy to score for their state. Uh, it's not something that we do often, but we regard this as a win-win opportunity. The governor has talked about some of the particulars. Um, let me just emphasize for you or underscore for you that this is something that comes with no liability to the state of Michigan. Uh, this fellow, this formidable negotiator, has secured an arrangement whereby Canada will front the costs of the bridge, bear all liability. If it costs more than expected, it's on Canadian taxpayers' shoulders. If revenues from the bridge from tolls are less than expected, it's on Canadian taxpayers' shoulders. We think this is a good deal, by the way. Um, and, and the governor has secured for Michigan uh, equal uh, control, equal ownership, uh, equal control of the construction and of the operations of the bridge, and an equal share in the revenues, the long-term revenues from the bridge. And let me tell you uh, that on a bridge built to last 125 years, as this one will be, as compared to bridges built in the 1920s that were supposed to last 50 years, the, um, the revenues uh, after uh, the builder is paid and after Canada is paid for its $550 million for the, inf for the uh, interchange uh, should total between three and four billion dollars between year 45 or 50 and year 125. That's Michigan's share. Canada will also receive between three and four billion dollars. That's free money in the sense that you assume no liability, you put nothing down, and yet 50 years, starting 50 years from now through year 125, um, I tell you, you want to have this fellow negotiating on your behalf. The, um, uh, this is something that has regional importance. I doubt that anybody in um, Michigan uh, is likely to be told by folks in Ohio or Indiana um, how they should uh, put, priori put priority on things, maybe particularly not people in Ohio. But the um, Ohio State Senate, the Ohio State House, the Indiana State House, the Indiana State Senate have all in the last seven months unanimously passed resolutions calling on Michigan to proceed with this project. Um, funny what can happen when there are no television commercials that are uh, that are run in, in, in the state. Uh, it's also the case, indeed. Um, it also underscores that um, they have a stake. Indeed, there are a lot of states that have a stake in the importance of this. I read this morning, Governor, in a publication in Washington, an academic uh, originally from Michigan, Chris Sands, he's at Hudson Institute, he said that if Al-Qaeda had really wanted to cripple the US economy, instead of bringing down the World Trade Center, they would have figured out a way to bring down the Ambassador Bridge. That's how important this is to our two economies. Um, just one other thought. Uh, the Detroit Free Press on the 17th of June, two days after the agreement, ran an editorial saying, why does, uh, saying Canada believes in Michigan. And indeed, they got it right. We do, because if we didn't, we wouldn't have taken this risk. Uh, the second paragraph of that editorial, I'll paraphrase, um, was, uh, it would seem that Canadians believe more in Michigan than most Michiganders do, which you know, that could be true, but if it is, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, you have every reason to believe in yourselves. Uh, you have, uh, you're soon gonna have some, some world-class new infrastructure, but you have world-class companies. You own the geography that allows you to be the hub for transportation and logistics for goods from Michigan to the world, you've got all of the trained labor force that you could possibly want and more coming out of great institutions all of the time. So we think that you should join us in believing as much in yourselves as what we clearly believe in you. And one way to signal that might be 
this November, uh, there will be, it would seem, a constitutional amendment proposal that's on the ballot. Um, legally, that likely has no uh, significance. We believe, Canada believes, that we've entered into a jurisdiction that has the legal ability to implement the agreement, just as you believe we have the legal ability. But wouldn't it be great if Michigander stood up and said, enough of the stunts, uh, let's move on, let's look forward, let's tell the world, tell Canada, and maybe even tell yourselves that you have a very strong and impressive future under visionary leadership, and you should be proud of that future and seize the opportunity that the bridge offers. Governor, thank you for this opportunity. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I really want to thank you, the, the Council General, for being here. And I appreciate you ha having the opportunity to hear them and get some feedback on that. And just to put it in perspective for you, one last point on our relationship with Canada. Um, Roy mentioned how we had grown from 63 to $70 billion of trade in a very short time. If you look at our trade with Canada, it's more than the next 25 countries combined. They are our partner, and they're a wonderful partner. So thanks again. I really appreciate you being here. With that, though, let me stop talking and uh, see if we've got some questions and such that we can um, hear from you in terms of different things. And we have, I think we have it set up so Dale and Dr. Nixon have some questions that have come from the audience. I, I always like this. I never get to see them, so it's always an interesting surprise for me just as much for you to hear what's on your mind. Are you kicking it off, Dale? Uh, this one comes from, uh, I'm going to try and get this right. What is the rationale behind the, uh, looks like cat in the income tax? Cut. Is it cut? Okay. What is the rationale in the cut of the uh, income tax? Sure, there is a proposal to cut the Michigan income tax in terms of moving up the timing of when the tax rate drops by several months, plus increasing the personal exemption. And the reason for that is, is because those are taxpayer dollars that we were accomplishing what we said we wanted to accomplish with the budget, and we had resources left, so shouldn't we give that back to the people that gave it to us? And to put that in perspective is when I say we accomplished our goals, we have an awesome budget in Michigan. We were a mess. If you think about it, we had shutdowns of government in two of the, like, the last three or four years before I took office. The last two years, because of a partnership with the legislature, we've gotten the budget done the fastest in the last 30 years, but more important than speed is quality. The budgets you saw last year, which was tough, because we had to deal with a billion and a half dollar deficit, so I know we had to ask for sacrifices from people. But this year, we actually had a surplus. And we're doing these budgets with no accounting gimmicks, no games, being much more open and transparent, I'm an old CPA. I'm the only CPA governor in the country. I think we could use more CPA governors around the country. <laughs> is we did a balanced budget that's a solid budget. We started paying down liabilities that hadn't been paid down in the fashion they should have been in prior years for a long time. We have continued to put money in the rainy day fund. And we still need to grow the rainy day fund. But with this budget, we're bringing it back up to about a half a billion dollars give you a perspective, when I took office, the rainy day fund had $2 million in it. Um, so there's more to do, but we thought we were being prudent by putting it on a regular periodic basis to add some more this year. Hopefully we'll add some more next year. And we had remaining dollars because of improvement in the economy. Give it back to the hardworking people of the state of Michigan is the right answer. Governor, this question is from Kirsten Doyle, who asks, as a small business owner, I'm wondering what kind of programs or incentives have been planned to help small business owners and to encourage others to come to Michigan to do business. Yeah, that's a great topic because if you look at job creation, it really starts with people that are in Michigan. So there are a couple aspects to that question I'd highlight. One is the question from a small business person, which is great. The second one, though, the last part was what are you doing to bring business to Michigan? 
Well, we fundamentally changed how we do economic development. I'm a private sector person. I came from the business world. And so I think it was a new appreciation of a different way of doing things. Because think about this. The old ways of doing things, which is still true in most of the country, when you're having a tough time, is they go out, and we were buying companies to come into Michigan with huge incentive packages. We'd offer these big incentive packages that amount to currently, we're, we're having to pay about a billion do, half a billion dollars a year in tax credits out. How many people knew that, that we were putting out about half a billion dollars a year in tax credits in terms of paying for deals that were done in earlier years? That's a lot of money, folks. And so my view is, is think about this if you're a business person or even at home. If you have a challenged business environment and your customers are having difficulty, do you work on making sure your current customers are the happiest, best customers, or do you go after new customers? Business 101 is, is you always take care of your current customers first. And so my methodology was, is let's stop going after these big companies with huge incentive packages. Let's say, how can we help Michiganders be successful right here? by creating the best playing field for businesses, whether you're a small business or a large business. Isn't that the way it should work? Is create the best competitive playing field so we can compete against anyone. And so we're focused on what's called economic gardening, which our first priority is to help people right here in Michigan. And then you ask the question, as we come back in Michigan, we'll start doing more. We're doing a little bit now, but we'll do more to bring companies to Michigan. But what's the best way to get somebody to come do business with you? to acquire a new customer. It's not the ad you run, and we have great ads, and it's not anything I say. It's a happy customer. It's word of mouth from a happy customer is the best way to get another customer. So it's really having Michigan companies speak up about why they love Michigan so much is the best way to get other people to come here. And then for small business, we did wipe out most of the incentives, but actually, if you're not incorporated, if you're not a regular corporation, and you're a small business that's unincorporated, a partnership or something, we did one of the best things. We wiped out the Michigan business tax, which was the dumbest tax in the United States. And one of my favorite lines is when I was campaigning, I ran against a bunch of people that were fixing Michigan, so they'd say, well, cut the surcharge or cut it in half. My answer is, if you got something that dumb, dumb divided by two is still dumb. Get rid of the whole thing. So we got rid of the whole thing, but also what I would say for small business people, we do have a lot of great programs that the Michigan Economic Development Corporation can happen. You've got good economic development people here in the Monroe area, but those are programs about not giveaways, but there's good loan programs and good business advice programs, and so I encourage you, they should contact these local groups or the state level, because we've got some great programs, again, not about spending money, but about helping make connections and build relations for success. Governor, you talk about the unfunded pension. Why is it unfunded? Where did the money go? A couple pieces. That one, we haven't been fully funding our pension obligations for a long time. And the other part is, is there are some changes in the stock market that affected many of us personally. So we're underfunded in the pension plan. But even more than the pension plan is for post-retiree medical. To the degree we're giving retirees medical coverage, um, we weren't setting aside any real money to pay for that. We're just doing pay as you go. That's not a smart answer. So we've built up huge liabilities, both at the st state level for state employees, which are better managed now, but then we have the Michigan Public Employee Pension System. And the Michigan Public Employee Pension System has about $45 billion in obligations outstanding. Think about that. Think about the mortgage you have on your home. Our mortgage is that $45 billion plus some other billion from the state plan plus debt we owe. And I can tell you we're finally being responsible about saying, shouldn't we be making payments on these plans? Shouldn't we be doing reforms? Again, respecting that people are counting on this too, and we want good retirement plans for people. But we need to be more thoughtful. And we need to look at how the private sector is operating, how we can fund these things to be financially responsible for the long time. Because that's one thing, again, that too much of government, all they did was look at was cash in and cash out in a one-year time frame. No one was looking at the debt. Again, as an accountant, I came in to say we're looking at the debt. I can tell you we're actually working hard. I'm working with our budget director where we're doing analyses now on 2030, 2040, and 2050. 
because we're coming up with reforms to say, in that time frame, how do we pay off the debt? Because one of the things you elected me on was more and better jobs, but the second one was a future for our kids. Now, on our watch, from the last 20 or 30 years, we haven't been responsible like we should. Is the right answer you just sort of let that keep going or you take responsibility, regardless of how it happened? Blame no one, but let's solve that problem. Use relentless positive action, let's solve it. And one thing I'm really proud of, we are the poster child for what Washington, D.C. needs to do. We know how to balance a budget. We're paying down our long-term liabilities. We need Washington to do the same thing. Governor Judy Green writes, is there a plan about returning the $470 per pupil funding that was taken from the students now that the school aid funding is in the black? Yeah, actually, And you can go back in the 470, there's a lot of dispute about what the number is, but we did have to make some cuts last year. And what I view, I believe it was much less than that, but as a practical matter, it's about 100. But if you look at it and you go through the analysis, the issue was is we had a billion and a half dollar deficit. And we did have to ask for sacrifice. There's no doubt about it. Was this easy? No. In a perfect world, would you like to do that? No. But we had to close a billion and a half dollar deficit so we asked for a much smaller reduction in education than we did in almost any other area. And we came up with ideas on how school districts could help save those dollars. And I recognize that was still tough. So this year we are increasing education funding in a reasonably good margin in terms of other priorities. Again, we're putting more money in education than many other things that we could be investing in because our kids are critically important. And the other challenging point is, is we need to work harder to get teachers to have faith in us, because a lot of times teachers are feeling put upon. We've asked for a lot of stuff and a lot of challenges, um, but teachers really do matter. Our educational system, though, needs to be reformed. Our educational system is not working right today. And teachers aren't the issue, it's the system overall. So that's where we need to work hard on coming up with better answers. So that's where we're going to continue to put dollars in education, but not spending money, just simply spending money. We need to see that there's a return on that. And so that's why we need to have metrics and measures to make sure we're getting student growth. And why do I say that? If you look at the numbers, only 17% of our kids are college ready. 17%. That's not right. And when people say, well, I don't know if I buy that number, if you talk to the community colleges, the percentage of kids having to take remedial classes coming out of high school is running about 60 plus percent. These are kids that got a high school diploma. They should not need a remedial class to take a college level class. So we have a real problem, and the focus is on reform to solve the problem, and teachers should be part of that, and I want to see teachers feel more empowered. So we've talked about things about creating a master teacher category to allow teachers to be mentors for other teachers. There's a lot of cool things that we can do by partnering together and understanding these are tough issues, but let's solve tough issues together. So I'm excited about the future, and I appreciate it. We've asked for sacrifices out of people over the last year. Hopefully we're on that positive path now, though. This one comes from Doug Darling. Many of the ballot proposals look to be costly to the state of Michigan. Are there any of the proposals uh, that have any benefit or value to our state? Um, I haven't formally come out on all of them, but most of them don't have a whole lot of value. Basically, all they're doing is messing with the Michigan Constitution, trying to go backward, um, taking us back, or making things more complicated or more expensive. And one of the things we need to do and this is a very personal thing, and I'll ask this for those of you that are about my age profile. I got out of school in 1982, and the closest time to the last few years was about 1982. We actually got, had higher unemployment back then. It got to about 15% or so. The Houston Post was being driven up to Detroit 
to be sold. The Sunday paper was being driven up by semi-loads because people were looking at the WAN ads in the Houston Post to take jobs in Texas. And what happened was is two or three years passed, and we got through that. 1985 came, 1986, things picked up in Michigan pretty nicely. They improved a lot. And you know what happened? We had amnesia about the bad times. We got complacent. We got content to say, oh, the bad times are over. We don't really need to change anything. We don't need to reinvent ourselves. Let's just keep the old thing going. And I can pick two or three other times that many of you here would have lived through too where we went through these cycles that things were bad, but when they came back, they said, oh, they're back again. We don't need to think about that. That was really dumb. And it finally came home this time. Because if you look at the trend line, the trend line kept on going down, even though we'd have these ups and downs. And that was my commitment to you. That's what I spoke about earlier. My commitment to you is not to be satisfied, not to be content, because we should not let this happen to us again. We need to reinvent ourselves. This is still a crisis. When you got 8.5% unemployment, it's still a crisis. Let's keep that fire and passion to use relentless positive action. No blame, no credit, just solving problems, solve the next problem, solve the problem after that, and go. And then we're going to be that great state again. We just have to have that conviction and not get lulled into a sense of, oh, we can go back to the same old ways. It doesn't work. And I hope those of you in my age profile can really cheer the fact that we got our act together this time. Governor Karen Shenivar writes, I retired in 2011 after 35 years. I need work, but she writes there's a law that prevents her from subbing. Will this be corrected? She has much to offer. And she says, I'm very viable employee for school. So we're assuming that she's a teacher. Yeah, well, I'd be happy to, I, I'm not sure of all the specifics of that issue, but I'd be happy to take that question back and we can try to follow up with her. Because again, we want to create an environment. There are some restrictions, again, some legislation that was passed before I came to office about people going back into their same system that was called double dipping to sort of manage that issue. And some of that went too far. So we're trying to be thoughtful about the right balance. So I'd have to learn more about the particular case, but I'm happy to have us follow up on that. Thank you. Martina Hillman, as a retired special education teacher, I planned my retirement based on the promised financial numbers. Now my pension has been taxed. My copay for my health insurance will be compromised. The police and fire and judges are under the same retirement policy. Why are the teachers and school personnel being targeted. No, this is the good part about getting questions like this so we can, ha we can talk about it. Because the way I view it is, is we didn't change people's pension at all. Again, that's protected in the Michigan Constitution and should be. You earned your pension. So you're keeping your pension. Now, when you start talking about other benefits, we build a dumb system in Michigan again. It goes back to being unsustainable. And that dealt with how we would tax pensions. And I'll give you a quick history on this. This goes back to the 1960s. When they did the personal income tax system, they excluded public pensions from the system, from the income tax. Not constitutionally protected. That was just the way the law was written. Now think about it. Is it fair that the public pension people don't have, pay anything, where if you had a private pension you paid, or if you didn't have to have a, happen to have a pension and you made income, you had to pay. That's not fair. So the solution a few years later, because they recognized they had messed up, instead of solving that problem the right way, they started excluding a bunch of private pension stuff. So if now, depending on what kind of private pension you still had to pay, and if you're the poor person that didn't happen to have the right job so you got a pension, you were having to pay. That's not particularly fair. So then you step back and say, well, shouldn't we have a fair system regardless of you know, the source of income? And then you say, one of the reasons that I think I got elected was keeping our kids in Michigan. So what happens if you create a retirement system and then you have a lot more people becoming seniors? So in the next 20, 20 30 years, we're going to have a lot more seniors. 
that wouldn't be paying anything under the system, you still got to pay for stuff, right? So what would happen then is you're shifting your tax burden to say, let's tax our young people more to pay for us. Now, is that a good message to send to young people to say, we want you to stay in Michigan, but we want you to pay more than we're paying? That's not fair. That's a way to drive them out of state. So we had a messed up system that went back 50 years. So what we did, though, because, again, you need to be sensitive to these things. There's no perfect answer. So what we did was we grandfathered people in that were already seniors. If they're 67 or older, the law doesn't change for you. You still get all those benefits. If you're between 67 and 60, there's a transition where you get most of that. And I'll remind you, your Social Security isn't going to be taxed, period. So we're not taxing Social Security at all. And we create an exclusion that can either be part of that or an alternative to say, if you have any kind of income, you get an exclusion up to 20000 for a single, 40000 for a couple. And that doesn't matter whether you had to work at the local retail store, McDonald's, you had a public pension or a private pension. That's a lot fairer. And then for people that are younger coming up, your pension isn't being touched at all. Again, that's protected. But to say, shouldn't you contribute something towards taxes because you're getting services? Plus you get, again, Social Security or this other exclusion. That's much better than any other age group of our citizens gets. So again, this was one of those tough things to say, we were building a house of cards, just like we did on that debt side, to say we we're building a house of cards that was unsustainable, we couldn't pay for it, was going to drive, help drive young people out of our state, and we might have been able to say we can wait another five or ten years to do this, but that's not why I believe you hired me to take this job. You hired me to reinvent Michigan and take on some really ugly issues. The easier answer would have just been to ignore it. But I don't feel I would have been doing the job you asked me to do if I wasn't honest and put that issue on the table. And again, ask for some sacrifice, but let's put something in place. Now our kids can be excited about Michigan. And the people that are already seniors doing it, we're not impacting them. And we can make this system work. So I appreciate that. That's why I'm, I like questions like that, because it's a chance to clear the air. It wasn't done just to cause somebody some trouble. It was to get us to get the facts out to say, we had done some really dumb things. And let's be honest about it, solve them. Relentless positive action. Governor, this question was written by Rosemary Braun, who writes, with rising costs of health care, why do elected officials still receive free health care? Well, when you say elected officials, the governor's not on that program, I can tell you, because we shouldn't. And so I think the legislature has made a number of changes, so that's being phased out. So that is being corrected in terms of health care, because the plan was way too generous. And that wasn't right, nor fair. So the legislature has addressed it for them in a go-forward fashion. The governor, th that had already been resolved from my office some time ago. So the good part is, is we are solving that. But we do, again, we need to be always sensitive to that because, again, if we're representing you, we need to be in the same spot everybody else is, not have a better deal. Ready? Next question. One more question. Well, that was the last one? Okay. Well, let me turn this mic over. I really appreciate the chance to be with you, but we have another special item here that I thought worth giving up the floor for because this is cool stuff. But I really want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. It's been very worthwhile. But I'm going to turn it over to Representative Zorn because he has another special guest to come up that I'm excited about. So I'll give it over to Dale. So thank you so much. Thank you, Governor Snyder, for being here with us today. This town hall is very beneficial to all of us in Monroe County as well as, as Michigan to hear the, the issues that we have. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Nixon to join us on stage, as well a friend of ours, a friend of Monroe County, 
Uh, friend of Michigan, Kurt Darrell, CEO of Monroe County's own Lazy Boy Chair Company. We have a very special announcement. Thank you, Dale, and uh, thank you, Governor Snyder and Representative Zorn for hosting this event in Monroe. Governor, your talk was right on target. We did hire you to take to, to tackle the tough issues. You're doing a marvelous job. And uh, I need to take speaking lessons from the guy from Canada. He's pretty sharp. <laughs> but, I, but I don't want to negotiate with you. I, uh, <clears throat> Today there was much discussion about private and public partnership and cooperation to build a solid future in Michigan. This year, Lazy Boy is celebrating its 85th anniversary, and we are proud to have spent all 85 years here in this great state and in the Monroe community. We are also proud of our continuing efforts in our community at large and the long-standing relationship our company has had with the Monroe County Community College. In 2004, the Lazy Boy Foundation committed $2 million to help build this beautiful Lazy Boy Center on campus and has been a wonderful addition to our community. And in keeping with the commitment to the community and the Monroe Community College, we are pleased to announce another significant contribution from the Lazy Boy Foundation. Lazy Boy will donate a half a million dollars to help fund the Career Technology Center to assist the college in fulfilling its mission to educate our citizens and provide them with the skills necessary to compete in a global marketplace. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, uh, <clears throat> we sincerely appreciate the opportunity to make this announcement at today's forum, and we would hope that this is the first of many contributions from our other organizations in the community to help fund this very, very worthy project. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kurt, and thanks to the foundation. Is June Ellen here, or Don Bloom, or Marv, the foundation members of Lazy Boy? And we can still say Lazy Boy rocks Monroe County. We are truly grateful. This has been a private-public partnership with Monroe County Community College and its community and this is the way you're helping us serve the community. And I might mention, Kurt, uh, for our folks as they leave the facility today, they'll see uh, a little plaque out there that's a tribute to the founders of Lazy Boy. And it is truly in keeping with their direction for Lazy Boy, and you've done a great job. Governor, thanks for being here today. This is a pleasure for us to host this event at Monroe County Community College and Representative Zorn and, of course, Representative Olson. But it is truly reinventing Michigan that our college is interested in. And uh, we are inspired by your comments and the comments of uh, your counterpart from uh, Canada who are giving us new inspiration. Thanks to all of you for coming out today. We sincerely appreciate this opportunity. By the way, the questions, uh, everyone had their email addresses on there. So the governor's staff, if they weren't asked, will have an opportunity to respond to those. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming out.